Sia Armajani was born in Tehran in 1939 and moved to Minnesota in 1960 to attend McAllister College in St. Paul. He has lived and worked in the Twin Cities ever since while exhibiting internationally. Armajani is best known today for his works of public art, bridges, gazebos, gardens, and reading rooms that are sited across the United States and Europe. Near the walker, the artist recently renovated 375-foot-long Irene Hicks and Whitney Bridge connects Loring Park to the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. And you may have noticed just this past week that um, it's for the first time been lit according to the artist's original specifications from 1988. In addition to these major works of public art, including the bridge, tower, and cauldron from the 1960, 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta, Armajani's studio has been the site of a rich and generative practice. The exhibition on view in four of our galleries now encompasses a wide range of works from painting and sculpture to computer generated films and interactive installations. Throughout his art engages with poetry and philosophy, mathematics and architecture, politics and history, some of which we hope to touch upon tonight. To follow the line is to explore Armajani's visionary proposals for both the physical world and the realm of ideas. Please join me in welcoming Sia Armajani. Thank you. Sia, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. So Sia, um, I thought we might get started. We've had so many conversations, you know, over the past uh, several years in your studio, um, and you've told me so many wonderful stories about uh, your childhood and growing up in Tehran, and I thought maybe that would be a good uh, starting point for us. Okay. <laughs> John, John Ashbury's mother told John Ashbury that if you want people to listen to you, you ought to talk about yourself. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do today. <laughs> I, I grew up in Tehran, went through grade school, high school, and three years of the university, which I studied philosophy. <coughs> then <coughs> my family kind of pushed me to come to the United States. I came here and I met my wife at McAllister College, Barbie. And we have been married for 52 years. <laughs> Since the very, from the very beginning, I forced myself to have an objective, concrete, visible objective, so I could follow it. I was not a good student whether it was grade school or high school or university. University was patterned after the French method of teaching. So you could, it was very, very difficult to get into the university. But it was very easy to stay. <laughs> There were people there who were there in their 70s. <laughs> and respected. Philosophy gave me clear direction of what to do and how to go about it. 
There is a philosopher, German philosopher, whose name is Martin Heidegger. He is very, very interesting. But right after the war, because he was, he had to sign a declaration in order to keep his job at the university, he signed that. No, there is no way to joke about it. He signed Nazi pledge to Adolf. <clears throat> Among his students, there were a young woman who later on came to the United States and became a philosopher. Anna Arendt. She is the one who revived Heidegger. She was of Jewish background and always defended Heidegger among New York intellectual that it was his profession he had nothing to do with it. Well, anyhow, <laughs> I'm not trying to condone his action or his philosophy because of his political makeup. His philosophy had to do with the existence itself, that you can define it only when you are there. So this idea of inside, outside, that architect use is meaningless, unless to say to be inside or to be outside. And this little phrase of to be inside or outside became very, very important for some crooked thinker like Adolf Hitler and we have a contemporary cartoon of him in the White House today. Yes, do it. I was trying to control myself. <laughs> but, but I can't, so. But I want to tell you, he is the most dangerous man to American democracy. Anything you can do to get him out of the White House, do it. Thank you. Okay. Well, see, uh, you've, you've touched on many things there. Um, <laughs> so, you know, m much of your work, even from your very early days, was quite political. You know, right now you talked about um, kind of the works that you've done that engage with what's going on today and maybe in terms of what you've done with Heidegger. But can you talk about maybe when you were in Tehran and um, in the 1950s um, and how you became more politically active with what was going well, on Well, that there? was very easy because we had the Shah to kick it on. <laughs> I, I, when I was fifth, when you are in high school, you're somebody. <laughs> because at that time, 75% of the population was uneducated. 
So being in the third, ninth grade, it was something, some achievement. And people look up, looked up to you. What was the question? <laughs> your, your political oh, involvement. Oh, yes. So. <laughs> In 1951, a very old man by the name of Dr. Mossadegh elected to become the prime minister. He was something to watch. He could cry when he wanted. He would laugh when he wanted. He would faint when he wanted. <laughs> he was fantastic. And he touched the nerve of the Iranian people by nationalizing the oil. The Brits had a total control over it. So he became a hero for people my age and older. And as, as that time, I was interested. I knew that's all I want to do, to be an artist. So I made my commitment by becoming a, a political artist from day one until now. Anything I do, it either in obvious way or a discreet way, is political. <clears throat> and there is no place better to exercise it except in democracy. Because people who live in democracy, like America, they don't pay any attention. <laughs> and that is one of the problems. But this generation which is coming up now, they're not going to be like ours. They're going to fight. They're going to be political. They're going to get involved in every aspect of life. And you should encourage them. And encourage them to do what they believe. Democracy is not something cheap. Pay, people have paid a heavy price to gain the democracy. Even today, in different corners of America, in the many corners of the universe, there are people who do not even know where America lives, when you say America, they bright up. Because they know we got something good going until this bomb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, he's an insult to American people. He's insult to American civilization. Don't even clap anymore. He takes it seriously. <laughs> I started going to southern part of Tehran. Like any big city, there is a poor side and a rich side. The south of Tehran was a poor side. You could tell you're there by looking at people, how they dress, what kind of shoes they wear, what they talk about, what kind of idiom they use, what kind of metaphor they use, how they greet each other, how they have their own particular language to keep the outsider outside. Persian language is abstraction in totality. There are 
many ways to tell one story. There is many ways, hundred ways, to say yes in order to convince your friend that you cannot come for the dinner. <laughs> because it is rude to say no. So you say hundred ways of yes, yes, yes. After 10, you should catch on that he doesn't want to come. So I started going to this a main post office was in the capital. And was built pattern after German architecture. People would sit on the steps and you go to this scriber and ask them to write a letter to your cousin or whatever you want. That gave me an idea. Then I started looking at Persian miniature and started my work. But my main work was to make night letters. It was uh, maybe 14 inches, 15 inches long, high, or 12 inches wide. I would write and use pictures and get my political emotion embedded in the writing and drawing. And then we'll pass it to a friend. And the friend will pass it to someone else. I ran 156 issue of this. I got, I got two of them back. Number one, because the first friend immediately came back to me terrified and said, I don't want it, take it. <laughs> and I got the 65th one, the last one. I ne never got a chance to send it out because I'm a, I was on my way to America. I use this kind of work of art. Okay. okay. And we should mention that these, you know, earliest works of yours are in the exhibition. Um, and as Sia was saying, they were, uh, you know, evoking these night letters that were these political leaflets or newsletters that were uh, circulated throughout the city under the cover of night. Um, so many of those works from that time period are kind of transportable. You can roll them up and stash them away. Um, so we were excited to, to show them here um, at the Walker. Um, so Sia, you kind of alluded to this right now when you just said, you know, the last light, night letter you were never able to send because you had to come to America. Can you talk a bit more about kind of the circumstances that led you to, you know, the Twin Cities? In 10th grade, in Persian literature class, a teacher said, there is a guy in America, his name is Emerson, and he has translated Hafez very famous Persian poet, in, from German into English. <clears throat> then everybody got very excited. You know, when you're not recognized in some corner of the world, some, who hear somebody actually knows something about you, it gives you a sense of pride. And then he felt our excitement about Emerson. Then he said, he's a f one of the first American philosophers. And then he translated some of his poem from English to Persian. 
And also he said he was a friend of Abraham Lincoln. And he taught, you see, before Gettysburg address, before the attack and everything, Lincoln asked Emerson to come to talk to him. And Emerson said, he would, Lincoln was looking for a statement that does not humiliate the opponent, the South. He said, touch them by grace. And then Lincoln turned it into that few lines. Anyhow, uh, this is the kind of work I did, this Persian style of work I did until 1964. Persian calligraphy, and I wanted to be a painter. In 64, I realized that I don't have that special talent because there is a huge competition out there. Look at those guys, 15th century, 16, 17, 18. <laughs> you see those museums? Full of those paintings. You cannot do anything. You have to admit it to yourself that that's not my cup of tea. So I became interested in conceptual art. and seriously look at the sculpture. Because at that time, sculpture was a second-class citizen. And there were very, very few American sculptors or European sculptors, very few in comparison with painting. So this conceptual art, all of a sudden, gave me my future. Because I realized I could take the philosophy, take the politics, take all these social issues that I'm interested in, and by conceptual means, get it out. At the same time, be an artist. In 19, should I go on? Yes, I, huh. I do want to stop you quickly, though. Okay. I, I, okay. I know yeah. you say you're not a painter, but we should point out that one of your first works that entered the Walker's collection in 1962 was a painting. Right that you submitted, right. and uh, we had at the time a 1962 biennial of painting and sculpture. Sia submitted two paintings, uh, one of them's Prayer, which is now in the Walker's collection, and the other is Prayer for Sun, and both are in the exhibition side by side, probably for the first time since right. they were shown then. And they are fantastic you know, paintings. And I remember you told me um, a really fun story at one point about how when you first came to the U.S. and um, you started, you know, college at McAllister, um, how one of your art professors, you know, showed you abstract expressionist art for the first time. Right. And how that, you know, kind of, you said at the time that it kind of gave you your ground. Right. Can you go into that a little bit? Yes. Uh, the teacher, his name was Mr. Rothquist. He had a fantastic collection of abstract expressionist painting in form of slides, neatly arranged on the shelves from one through twelve, hundreds of them. And I got the permission from him to go and look at these slides. And every day after other classes, which I didn't go to many of them. <laughs> uh, I would go sit in his office with a slide projector and look, and I was so amazed, 
so impressed. How could a human being think like that? You know, forgetting that all the Persian calligraphy, Persian tapestry, they were all abstract. They were all abstract. But there was a difference. That was geometric, geometric abstraction. And these guys let the inner self have a place to play. I, the person who impressed me the most was Franz Klein. This is the one with the black paint on a white canvas with a brush. Because it has a calligraphic touch to it. Uh, actually, later on I learned that he would take the newspaper, Japanese newspaper, and projected large in his studio. Fantastic. <laughs> That's what makes a difference between someone who's good and the rest of us. <laughs> you, there is a mind, a special mind. I was totally fascinated. Then, of course, the Kooning and Jackson Pollock, the rest of it. Okay, go ahead. And then, Sia, you were, you were going to touch on your conceptual work. So these are yeah. works you made in the late 60s, yes. early 70s, oh, uh, and before, yeah. before as yeah. well. Yeah. I did the abstraction, uh, the uh, conceptual art that was going on in New York in 1966. That was the earliest one. And I was doing this without knowing anything about this huge movement of conceptual art until a teacher came of first year of my teaching at MCAT. MCAT. His name is Barry Levey, and he's first-rate artist, very good, excellent. He was spending some time studying, working in a conceptual way. One day uh, I asked him to come to my studio. And, and I showed him this thing. He said, they're fantastic. He said, do you have more? I said, yes, I got a lot of these things. But I have never shown it to anyone. He said, no, no. In fact, I forget the name of uh, the art critic. Who's the one that did that number show in Argentina? Oh, Lucy Lepard. Lucy Lepard. He, he knew Lucy Lepard, he wrote to him, and then I got a letter from Lucy Lepard asking me to send a couple of pieces for this show, which was inaugurated in Argentina. What a horrible place that place was. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. You know, this, this, that guy was in England. They're all related. You know that. All these queen and their children, they go in, in their incestuous parasites. They, absolutely, there is no question about it. They're all related. You know, you know this uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth, the daughter, the second daughter? Margaret, who died. Then they have another one. She was cousin to the king of Spain. 
They're all related together. And that's how they keep the power going. Anyhow, I don't want to say. Go ahead. So, yeah, okay. Sia, you were talking about uh, Lucy Lepard and kind of the works that you were making when, uh, kind right. of about the intersection of art and science, art and technology. Correct. I, uh, I would say that really gave me a platform, conceptual art. But I did a, a, sh a tower which will cast a shadow all across the state of North Dakota. <laughs> you know, uh, a curator at Museum of Modern Art wrote me a letter, invited me to show this piece. <laughs> then he says, when did you finished building it. <laughs> it is going to be 18 miles high, <laughs> but two miles wide. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Anyhow, I realized this is not going to give me enough nourishment to carry me for the rest of my life. And you could begin to, to smell that what is going to happen again. You know, it was very easy to predict by the time conceptual art was accepted. You knew it was going to die because art teacher became one of the strong advocates of that. And you know that was a kiss of death. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, then I said, oh, I have to think very seriously. So I started uh, public art. This is art for the folks. And spent 40 years of my life building bridges, gardens, reading rooms, reading gardens, this, this kind of thing. Mostly was influenced by John Dewey. Uh, John Dewey, he was a socialist American philosopher. He's very, very big at the University of Frankfurt. I gave a, three lectures there on John Dewey. And the audience every night will grow. Because they, they took John Dewey very seriously. And he was a very serious philosopher. So this public art made me to travel all over America, some part of Europe. I built seven bridges in Germany, France, Holland, that's it. <laughs> and at the end, it's 1999. I had to give a lecture at Yale University. Caesar Pelley was the chair of the architecture department. As Caesar and I have collaborated a couple of bridges together. He, he's a very, very nice guy, very nice. So we became very good friends. And he asked me to come I give a lecture because at that time 
public art became very, very known. All over America, every city had a budget for it. And I gave a lecture of public art, and that was a farewell, because at the end of it, I said, I'm finished with that. <clears throat> then from 2000 until now, I'm free floating. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I feel good. Go ahead. See, I'm wondering if you can talk about some of your earliest public works um, before you, you know, bid farewell to them. Uh, like First Bridge or Bridge Over Tree, which you uh, created yeah. here at Walker Art Center. Yeah. Uh, the first bridge, the Bridge Over the Tree, was a 80 feet long bridge to go over an evergreen tree. And you planted the tree before yeah. building the bridge. Yes, <laughs> because they called, they said if tree gets gets killed or dies out of la lack of sunshine, we're going to burn the whole Walker Art Center. <laughs> these, these were environmentalists, huh? is that correct? These were environmentalists? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that very year, mathematics department at the University of Wisconsin got burned down. So, Martin said to me, get it out of here. <laughs> I couldn't blame him. <laughs> so, but Martin kept that idea of the bridge in his head until this new bridge came. He called me up. He said, Mickey is telling me to invite you to give a proposal for this bridge. He said, I know I should not do it, but she insists. So I, I said, when do you need it? He said, well, in a week or so. I said, I will, I will send it to you this afternoon. I did it to half arc and Mickey was supportive of my work more than Martin. <laughs> so I got it. I had the ace in the hole. So <laughs> I, the the only part well it's not the only time. But we had fights every single day. Martin and I every single day. The time came towards the end. I said, Martin, I didn't want to bring it up to you, but I have to do it. He said, what is it? I said, I want to commission a contemporary poet and commission him to write a special poem for this bridge. He said, can't you find a dead poet? <laughs> I said, no, no, it has to be contemporary. I pushed to hire a musician to compose. And I said, you and John Cage are close. Why don't you ask John Cage to compose a, a piece of music for this garden? and." bridge and sculpture garden. Anyhow, he said, did you tell anybody else about this uh, poetry? I said, Marty, the first day I introduced my idea, I told them. He said, did you tell the highway department? I said, yes. He said, OK. But the budget will come from your budget. <laughs> and he said, see, uh, 
don't fall for these guys. You know, I tell you, I have to think this way and my feelings are like that. <laughs> he said, so I went to New York because I had met uh, John Ashbery 10 years before that, by a totally accident. And he said, he just died two years ago. He's a great, great 20th century American art, American poet. No question about it. He, I said, uh, Marty said, how much are you thinking about it? I said, well, uh, I'm going to give him $10,000. Marty said, are you crazy? <laughs> he said, I'm not going to raise 10000 to give to a poet. No, it's out. So I went to New York, and I said, Mr. Ashbury, I'm very sorry. We have only $10,000 to give it. <laughs> and you know, he almost fell off his chair. <laughs> He said, the biggest commission, that was 1988, the biggest commission I have ever received was $500. <laughs> then I came back, and he sent me a poem, and I gave a copy to Marty. He said, I hate it. <laughs> I said, read it. He said, no, I hate it. He said, secondly, you are going to pay for it. I'm not going to put and show it to my trustees that I have spent $10,000 on a piece of poetry. I said, Marty, it's too late. He's, he has written it, and he's gracious enough to offer it to us for our ideas. And John Ashley was very gentleman. He said, if you don't like it, I'll try again. I said, no, no, that's wonderful. So, Martin gave the 10,000. <laughs> and we, through all these fights, we became a very, very close friends. And we had lunch and breakfast at Minneapolis Club <laughs> for four years. Yeah, maybe you want to talk a bit about also the gazebo in Loring yeah. Park. Um, that's the gazebo for four anarchists. Right. And I'm curious, that piece, in addition to a couple of the other works, for example, in the uh, exhibition, we have your Sacco and Vanzetti reading room. Right. It, um, both are works that are dedicated to these Italian-American anarchists. Can you talk about I, your yeah. interest in... Oh, yes. I, I, I love the, love the man. Sacco Vanzetti, they, they were simple guys, except the American promise, and they came to America. They were not anarchists before they got here. They became anarchists when they landed here. Because they said, America, you promised me education, I have to work in a shoe factory. And Justice uh, Frankfurter came to their defense and wrote a beautiful uh, dissertation and proved that they could not have done this crime. There is a book, I forget the name of the writer, he came out four or five years ago. He's a woman, fantastic. Susan, Susan Tejada. Huh? Susan Tejada. Say it wrong. It's, it's Susan Tejada in search of Sacco Manzetti. Okay, yeah. So uh, when we lock with the, by the way, all my close friends are Republican. <laughs> You know, when, uh, uh, when uh, 
Bush, first Bush was running against Dukakis. All the workers, we had to paint the bridge so it will be finished by 10th of September. All the workers were voting for Bush, including Wheelock Whitney. And my car was the only one with Bush, with the, with the, <laughs> the caucus. <laughs> See, you were talking about kind of your, your interest in these, these immigrants who became uh, political anarchists once they arrived in America. Well, uh, I'm an immigrant. You know, you, when you come from somewhere else, your expectation, the closer you get to the United States, your expectation grows. And you believe everything. All the impossible dreams, you believe in it. Because somebody has done it. So you come here as though you were born again. It, it gives you an incredible feeling of freedom and possibility. You don't accept people when they say, well, this is impossible to build or that. You become positive. You get a new life. And this anarchist, I have always, maybe I'm myself an anarchist, but I, but I'm a peaceful guy. I, uh, I don't. Uh, we, when Barbie and I are going out at night, I don't believe even in self-defense. I always, I'm arguing with her, which side of the street she's going to be on, from what side of the street I come, so she will not be alone. If somebody attack her, I have to attack him. Well, I, I'm not too much of that, you know. <laughs> you know all, but there is something in the totality of American democracy is anarchist. There is something, you know, the way to experience that is late at night, about one o'clock, two o'clock, turn the television on and just surf it, you know? You said to yourself, how can this country exist? <laughs> Look at what people are saying. But the next morning you get up, everything's fine. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> Yeah, I like how you, you talked about kind of, you know, as an immigrant, this, the promise of American democracy and, and how much of your work also alludes to kind of the failure of that democracy in certain instances. Um, one other thing you've told me in the past that I've uh, really enjoyed hearing about is how in Iran you said that people were weighed down by history, that there was this kind of heavy stone of history on people's shoulders, and how in America it was very different. Can you talk about kind of that Distinction? Yeah, yeah, there is a philosopher named Paul Tillich. He's a Christian existentialist theologian. He said, even the past achievement could oppress you. I remember John, Johnny Guitar. When I came here, it was very, very big in Tehran. Everybody was singing it or playing it. So I went to this store which sells records, and I said, could I have a Johnny guitar? She said, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember that. It was, I, 
told Barbie later on that I wanted to have lobotomy to get rid of all these horrible ideas I have in my head. We, we had to memorize, I'm not exaggerating, 7,000 years of history. So every king was one line. That's all they could do it. So the, this history can paralyze you. So I like, I like this freshness of America. Oh, I never thought of it. And also this diminishing value that they attach to history. You know, in art, in art history, today, when you talk to the student about art and history, it's the last issue of Art Forum. <laughs> Beyond that, they don't even remember, which is good. So, Sia, you were saying that um, up until 1964, your works were kind of looking back, and you said with the new conceptual works, that really, and with public art, it kind of helped you look forward. Um, but then earlier on, you were saying um, at a certain point, you realized that public art failed. And so can you talk a bit more about why you felt that there was this failure in public yes, art? Yes, yes. Uh, Robert Pincus Witten is a art critic, and in the 70s, he was very big. He was friend of Scott Burton and I. And Scott Burton and I were two most serious ones among all the public artists. He said, you're deceiving yourself. That's an illusion. It will never go anywhere. Give it up and get involved with your serious work. And he was right, because we realized that all of a sudden everybody became a public artist. And we said, what are you going to do? I'm going to make a bench. Every bus stop, there is a bench. They, they gravitated toward the easiest solution they could. And we didn't have Obama. If Obama was president while we were public artists, he would understand and he would encourage us. I always told them we need a political pressure. That, that is why. Well, I, I just noticed it's been an hour already somehow, okay. but. Oh. I think, I'm sorry. No, I think we've been so engaged in, in your stories. Um, I think it might be nice if you can talk about some of your more recent works, the, the Rooms for Hospitality, and I know you just made a work in these past few weeks um, that you've now oh. shipped off to, to France right. uh, for a show. Right. So maybe we can uh, there. Uh, My statue of I don't, what's the name of the town? Toulouse. Toulouse. Christian Bernard, who was a curator of Mamco. Right. Every summer, he has a show in Toulouse. And he's an international artist. And subject matter, there is no overall subject matter. But he's a political person, so he leaves it open. So what I did, I took the Statue of Liberty, two-dimensionally, what, 10 feet high. Then I have the gift, the letter which was attached to the gift of a statue. It says, as a French citizen, I'm giving this 
statue to American people. So I, knowing what is going to happen, if this election he wins, he takes everything home. I said to wrote a letter to Christian Bernard. I said, as a citizen of the United States, I am returning <laughs> the Statue of Liberty for safekeeping. <laughs> and then I gave him, I said, in case they break the statue and destroy all the documentation, I copied all the documentation, size, and Eiffel, who built the tower in Paris, he did the sculpture part of it. Base. Base. How you go from the base all the way to the hand, to the light. You can walk up there, stairs. How a stair is coming. So I send them this. It's about 10 feet high, 5 feet wide. That was the last one. The other one is a, just it takes very short time, but that's very important. Uh, Jean Derrida, French philosopher, gave a series of lectures at California's famous college, university. Stanford. At Stanford. Stanford. Three series of lectures, I don't know how many. And he talked about hospitality. He says sometimes the guest becomes more powerful than the host and takes over. And quotes different philosopher and brings the example. This eruption that took place in Syria upset the whole Europe. But the strength of German and German people kept it together. The countries were just about to give up. They couldn't deal with so many immigrants coming. Here we had a better solution. We ripped the child from the mother's arm and hide them someplace. I said, come and find them and take him. We don't want them anyhow. So I did seven of these rooms for hospitality. One of them is Deep, deportee room for hospitality for deportee because that was when uh, Trump said he was going to kick every Muslim from America to go out. Then he, no, nobody can come in. But all those people who have money, they come in. They all come in. The second one I did was a, which is in the show, it said uh, for migrant worker. Migrant worker. At the, the, the house, you cannot get in, but there is a bed outside, and the pillow is from. <laughs> a Hilton hotel Hilton pillow. Hilton hotel. We found <laughs> I found it. Honest. <laughs> okay, it's your turn now, if you have any questions. Thank you, Sia. So we'll open it up for questions for about 15 minutes. So we have mics uh, going up and down on either side. So please just raise your hand uh, if you have a question and uh, we'll get you a mic.
So yeah, can you speak about the Mount Vesuvius competition you entered years ago? The Mount Vesuvius uh, competition. I think it's yeah. the, the Sound Towers yeah. piece. Talk about it. Yeah, the Sound, the sound Towers. The, the concept Could you find something easier? <laughs> He said, couldn't you find something easier to ask? <laughs> I, I, I just thought it was a great idea. <laughs> well, this, this is a work that's in the exhibition catalog. Right. Uh, we, we got the voice, the sound, the graphic sound of Vesuvius during the eruption. Then Steve Kahn, who was a professor at the university and worked at the space department, designed the Vesuvius mountain, all by calculation and the use of computer, and we generated the same sound. I don't have the tape. I lost it. It was, it was like the wind blowing across a Coke yeah. bottle. Yes. It produced the sound. Right. Um, they didn't. They, they, they never. You never built it, so. No, no. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, so, I it was, I mean, I looked at your exhibition three times, and I, I'm a real big fan of your work. Uh, my one of the questions I have about the show is first uh, uh, on your early work statement. Uh, you have a statement for your early works. It's been like. Uh, sort of orchestrated in early works and then all the way to contemporary works. Um, it talks about the coup d'etat in Iran uh, runs you outside of Iran and like makes you leave the country because of the political issues and the, com the, the basically shock comes back. But there is nothing in the statement stating that the coup was orchestrated by CIA and, and MI6. Is there a, like a curatorial reason behind hiding that very important part? I, I still find it in your artistic narrative that it's very important, your uh, life in America and the relationship and with Iran and also the, all the translation of that Iranian political activism, not just because I really like your work, but I'm a younger generation Iranian artist, and I am living here, and I have never had the honor to meet you, so I'm really happy. <laughs> uh, and so I, I wanted to ask why it's not there. And another thing, how much you... Uh, are like in favor of the books that the Slavs and Tatar put in your reading rooms because I found them very, very interesting books that it was very interesting for me to see all these uh, basically um, black community and communist philosophers and um, activists who is talking about the influence on, of communism on the black activism in America. It was fascinating for me, and just two questions. So, Cien, I, I may be able to help you out here, but the first question was about um, the CIA and MI6-backed coup that um, ousted Mohammed Mossadegh, and um, as this gentleman pointed out, that you know detailed information is not in the interpreted materials that accompany the show. Um, and I think we do mention that it is a US-backed uh, coup, but what we, um, 
we really focus on it in the exhibition catalog. So if you um, pick up the catalog, we have quite a few essays actually that focus on um, the role that uh, the U.S. and um, the U.K. played uh, in that in that ouster. Um, so there is more more detail and depth there. Um, the other question was about the Slavs and Tatars, the selection of the books in the um, Sakon Vanzetti reading room. And so that was um, a choice that uh, we made in, in conversation with Sia to engage a kind of a younger contemporary um, artist collective, Slavs and Tatars, to select the books because usually the books are, um, the institution can choose whichever books populate the reading rooms. Um, Slavs and Tatars, who also contributed to the exhibition catalog, um, were, are very much influenced by Sia's work. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with their practice, uh, they, um, much of their work engages books and libraries and reading, um, and they've said that Sia actually has been one of their you know, uh, biggest influences. So we asked them to select those books, um, and uh, they were very much influenced by the fact that the reading room is dedicated to Sacco and Vanzetti, um, who were these Italian-American anarchist communists. Um, so the books that they selected are part of their latest research cycle um, called Red Black Thread, and uh, they're looking at uh, the construction of race and um, uh, concepts of blackness from a Soviet communist perspective, and that you probably picked that up from the, from the different books in the room. Um, but they will be here actually on October 11th uh, giving a lecture performance in conjunction with the books in that room. Um, so they'll really uh, dive into um, kind of the overarching concept uh, in greater depth. We, in our Walker shop, we definitely do have some Slavs and Totters uh, books available, but this is a, a very new research cycle for them um, that they're just embarking on and um, experimenting with us. So this will be their first uh, premiere of that, of that Red Black Thread um, research cycle. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the bridge. You were saying that almost all your art has a political message, either overtly or underneath it. I have a hard time seeing the political message in the bridge that goes between the garden and the park. And if I had a second question, the gazebo on the other side with the anarchists, you know, I live right near there. And it's so often filled with homeless people or people drinking, and it's even been, you know, uh, some destruction of it. It's almost like a political statement in that way. But just your comments on what is the political uh, underlying of the bridge itself and maybe a little bit about that gazebo and how it's ended up being used or uh, works in the uh, other side there in the Loring Park. I have rhymes. You know, I have the right to contradict myself. <laughs> okay. See, so, yeah, maybe is there something that you want to say about the Jefferson Yellow, and maybe there's a no. 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 Okay, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, I think we have uh, time for maybe a couple more questions. Hi, Sia. Uh, I'm from Rashtiran. And my question to you is, uh, have you ever been approached to do any kind of work in Iran? And what brings you to Minnesota? Before I came here, I never heard of Minnesota. <laughs> I, in 2005, Khatabi was the president. Prior to that, he was head of Ershad Islami. When he was the head of Ershad Islami, he wrote me a letter, invited me to come to Tehran and build a park in Tehran. That was two, three years into revolution. 
by the time we got to get to Iran was 2005, and he was out of office. But I was very, very impressed. I gave a talk at the Museum of Contemporary Art. I was so impressed by the knowledge the audience had about art, especially American art. And all the questions they would ask was very, very deep and thoughtful questions. We had a wonderful, wonderful time in Tehran because I have not been back at that time was 40 years. And when they were taking me from the airport to our hotel, they all were using the new name, old name. I said, I know the old name, just give me the new names. <laughs> and they didn't want to. They were, they have grown anti-revolution which I feel that now, I know it. But at that time, I didn't. And I got into an argument with them. Did I answer it? Yes, and my, my second part of the question was, what makes you to come to Minnesota? Was there any connection here? Did you know anything? Oh, no. My, my uncle was a professor of history at McAllister College. <laughs> you know, I had two acceptance, one from Princeton, not because of my knowledge, but because my uncle has gone there in 1933, and then my cousin, and then my nephew. So I got two receptions, one from McAllister, one from Princeton. And I went for McAllister. Yes, I am, thank you. Yes, please. You go ahead. Go ahead. Here. See, Armajani, uh, yes. back when we were students at MCAD in the early 70s, you brought up the idea and concept of holograms. Right. And I believe you worked with um, Lake Forest College in Illinois, is that correct? Right, Forest College, right. Yes, and I wonder if you could digress a little bit because the reason I bring that up is back at that time, the concept of artists working with scientists was very unusual. And I wonder if you could digress about that a little bit. Let's digress together. <laughs> it was just a pure coincidence that I met Steve Kahn, who was teaching at the University of Minnesota. And because of him, I registered as a student in control data. And I met the president of Control Data. I forget his name. Do you know, Do you know the president? <laughs> Bill Norris. Bill Norris, yeah. He was a wonderful man. And he came to the class and came to me and said, what are you doing here? Because at that time I was younger, and most of the students were middle-aged people who were trying to learn new science. That, he was a wonderful man, a, a great deal of compassion for people and trying to use the new technology to help them. And he tried, but ultimately 
he ran out of money. So, Bill Norris, wonderful guy. I'm sorry I cannot say anything else. Just, uh, you know, you, you get caught up in the moment. And when you don't have anything else to do, it's the one, should I try this? Right. Is it, Do you want to talk about that piece? Uh, go ahead. It's, it's in the catalog, okay. Ghost Tower. First National Bank of Minneapolis. They want to create a, a new sign to announce themselves. So they asked me to go for a luncheon, and then they said, we want you to create a something we don't know what, <laughs> to attract First National Bank to become attractive to people. And I went home and I started thinking and thinking of holography and then this professor, I forget his name, of Forest College. What? T.J. Jung. Dr. Jones. <laughs> yeah. That is Stan Shetka. <laughs> he's, a, he's a very inventive artist. And he teaches at Gustavus uh, Adolphus College. <laughs> I went there to to his office, and I told them, is such a thing possible to project with the holography another First National Bank on the top of First National Bank? He said, oh, yes. He said, but I don't think you have the money for it. I said, no, I'm not going to pay this bank. He said, well, to be on the safe side, tell him 10 million. <laughs> so I came back and I told him. I said, you can do it, but 10 million. <laughs> they thanked me. <laughs> so I think we have time for one last question. Yeah, I, I got, got it here. Oh. Um, we can do two. <laughs> um, so the, the catalog is amazing. It's really good. And I found something in there, uh, a poem. I, I would call it a poem that you wrote, uh, Notes on Exile. And it's about uh, King Solomon inventing glass and memory and Rumi, you know, breaking that glass and finding <sighs> more. And then you talk about glass being uh, not of the self, but of the other. And I wanted you to, to talk about that in relation to uh, the amazing Fallujah piece. Was that, was that where this came from, or was this a manifestation of that? In no, no, Fallujah came. Guardian newspaper it was it October of 74. made a couple of lines and a very obscure picture and said, Fluja is another Guernica. And for a long time, I wanted to do something with Guernica. I had this idea for many years but I didn't know how to approach it. It's, it's something, that painting. And yet, 77 was the 70th anniversary of Guernica being painted. 2004, 2004. 2004, so 2004 I did and 2007. 
and it was a very very painful work because it directed its its attention to become anti-American and I and I could not accept that and it was very very painful experience very painful but I'm glad I did it and I think it turned many people have tried that Gerdica to paint it, but I did it in sculpture. And if you remember, Gernica in front, at the bottom, there is a flower growing. It's a sign of hope. I have a baby in the back part of the Fuluja that peacefully sleeping. And Sia, your use of glass in Fallujah and your glass works, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, in, at the end of First World War, European were flat broke, especially architect. So they created this conceptual they call it German Expressionist. And they did it, the only material they used was glass. And they did the small models. Of, and they built only one glass house. Only one. Then later on, there is a a French architect, he built a glass house in Paris. Philip Johnson, now history shows that he's nothing. He, Museum of Modern Art, was trying to have a show of this French unknown architect. And Philip Johnson was working at the Museum of Modern Art. He got, he made a show about himself. <laughs> but you could tell it's a second hand. <laughs> so, is that all right? It's great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. everything. Thank you. Okay, we'll have our final question, Sia, here. Thank you so much for all of your work. Um, my question is the poetry about the bridge. Where is it and can we read it? Is it part of the exhibition? The Minneapolis Bridge. Ah, the, the poem that... Yes, yes. What poem? The question is about the poem that runs along the bridge. Oh. And... It, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. <laughs> go ahead. Please. Well, I was going to say, maybe you can talk about how you spaced it al along, yeah. the, along the piece. I use the cadence of the written word to overlap the cadence of your walking. So you walk and you read at the same time. You know, uh, do you have any book by John Ashbery? You know, he has some beautiful poem, but you never heard him read. You're, you're blessed because it was the most <laughs> torturous experience of your life. <laughs> you, you just, it would kill you. <laughs> but he's a great poet. Don't mix them. Okay. All right. Well, okay. thank you so much, Sia, thank and thanks to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>